Hello. Look around. Are you wearing a stethoscope? If so, you may be a doctor. Look around again. Do you see beakers? If so, you may be a scientist. Let's assume that both of these things are true. I will call you Dr. Scientist. Welcome, Dr. Scientist. Let's talk about amiodarone. This session was recorded in April of 2011. Primary sources for the information in this program include the 2010 American Heart Association Guidelines for Resuscitation, the ILCOR CoStar document upon which those guidelines were based, the AAOS Paramedic Pharmacology Applications Textbook, the National Institute of Health, and the manufacturer's information provided in the physician's desk reference. Please consult your local medical oversight for specific instructions, authorization, and additional information. Since you call yourself Dr. Scientist, I'm going to make some assumptions. First, I'll assume that you know the basics of pharmacology. Next, I'll assume that you are an emergency medical care provider. Third, even though you call yourself Dr. Scientist, you may in fact not be a real doctor. So, you want to know about amiodarone, you sly devil you. To begin with, amiodarone is considered a broad-spectrum antiarrhythmic medication. That is, it has multiple effects on the electrical activity of the heart. These effects include a delay in the rate of repolarization, a prolongation in the electrical phase during which the heart's muscle cells are electrically stimulated. This is called action potential. A slowing of the speed of the electrical conduction in the heart. A reduction in the speed of firing of the SA node and a slowing of conduction through various specialized electrical pathways called accessory pathways which can be responsible for many arrhythmias. In these ways, amiodarone acts similar to beta, sodium, potassium, and calcium channel blockers. Amiodarone is typically prescribed as a long-term oral antiarrhythmic medication. As a result, you will often find information pertaining to amiodarone in that context, not as an emergent antiarrhythmic. I mention that because even though you can normally trust everything that you read on the internet because it's true, with amiodarone, much of the information that you find might be misleading because it refers primarily to precautions and side effects that pertain to patients taking the medication over the course of weeks to months to years. Remember, this is an exception. In all other cases, you must trust the Internet completely. Today, we're going to focus on the use of amiodarone in emergency medicine and the 2010 ECC guidelines. In that context, amiodarone is fast-acting and appropriate for both cardiac arrest and non-arrest rhythms, but comes with some cautions to keep in mind. Open your doctor-scientist notebook, because we're going to talk about those now. As a doctor of science, you know that the administration of any medication can have risks that must be measured against the benefits of what we expect to gain. Like virtually all emergency medications, it should be administered with due regard, using the dose and concentration appropriate to the circumstances. So what are those circumstances? According to the 2010 ECC guidelines, amiodarone is indicated for patients in cardiac arrest with refractory V-fib or VTAC, and for patients with stable, wide, complex tachycardia. We'll talk about dosing in a minute, so hold your horses. First, what about those contraindications? The only absolute contraindication to the emergent administration of amiodarone is, of course, say it with me, known allergy to amiodarone. There you go. That's it. Relative contraindications include most circumstances where you wouldn't be giving amiodarone anyway, like bradycardia, second or third degree heart block, and cardiogenic shock. Duh. Also important to know is that amiodarone has Class D pregnancy safety and as such has health risks for the fetus, the fetuses, the, the feti, fe unborn children. As in all such situations, a careful risk-benefit analysis must be made prior to administration. Well, 
We already know that administering multiple antiarrhythmics together typically worsens a patient's condition, so it's no surprise that we don't want to administer amiodarone in conjunction with other antiarrhythmics such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or lidocaine. As a doctor and a scientist, both together and at the same time, you're probably wondering, If I administer lidocaine as an anesthetic for easy I.O. placement, isn't that giving multiple antiarrhythmics? The answer is no, since the dose given for local anesthetic is subtherapeutic and will not affect the administration of amiodarone as the primary antiarrhythmic. Finally, the most significant side effect of amiodarone is hypotension, which can be exacerbated by doses of more than 2.2 grams in 24 hours, which is above typical initial doses. Also, amiodarone pulmonary or liver toxicity is possible, typically during long-term administration. In this case, long-term means weeks to months, not minutes to hours. The great thing is that as emergency care providers, our decision is going to be either assessment or algorithm-based. I mean that if we already know that this particular patient is in stable tachycardia and responds well to a specific medication, we may choose to administer that medication. If, however, as under most circumstances, that information is not available, amiodarone offers pretty much one-stop shopping for all your stable, wide, complex tachycardia and VFib VTAC needs. So, Dr. Scientist, I see you weighing your options. Why pick amiodarone over another antiarrhythmic like... Lidocaine. Well, amiodarone has long been preferred by the American Heart Association as it's been shown in blinded, randomized, controlled clinical trials to be better than both lidocaine and placebo in termination of arrhythmias and in increasing survival to hospital admission. But is lidocaine safer? That's a difficult question to answer, Dr. Scientist. Lidocaine has its own side effects, including toxicity and seizures, and if we're pulling the trigger on administering an emergent antiarrhythmic, we probably want to give the one that's been shown to be more effective. So when do we pull the trigger on amiodarone? In cardiac arrest, it's pretty straightforward, really. We give it to help resolve V-fib or pulseless V-tac that has not responded to the initial defibrillation. Stable tachycardia? Well, what the heck is stable? Most people would say a patient with symptoms such as palpitations, dyspnea on exertion, or mild chest discomfort is stable. For these patients, amiodarone is an option, but you might want to wait until you have additional resources available such as blood thinners. Any patient with altered mental status, severe shortness of breath, or significant chest pain is unstable and requires immediate cardioversion. Just remember which side of the picture you want to be on when that happens. All right, let's talk about administration. It's suggested to administer amiodarone through an infusion pump, using glass, specialized IV equipment, and mixed with D5W. But what if you can't do that? Well, as long as you're not administering the amiodarone for more than two hours, it's been determined that there is little risk for problems with standard PVC-based tubing. Also, while there is a theoretical potential for precipitation when mixing the amiodarone with normal saline, no such case has ever been documented. As always, should precipitation occur, do not administer or discontinue the medication. Duh. Also, as infusion pumps are often not available during many emergency situations, including much pre-hospital care, standard drip chamber measurements will suffice. The 2010 ECC guidelines recommend the following doses for amiodarone. In cardiac arrest for V-fib or pulseless VTAC, 300 mg IV push. If needed, a second dose can be administered, 150 mg IV push. For stable wide complex tachycardia, 150 mg slow IV over at least 8 to 10 minutes. A typical loading mix to make this easy is 150 milligrams in 100 milliliters run in over 10 minutes. On conversion of the rhythm, follow with an infusion of 1 milligram per minute for the first 6 hours. Typical infusion mix, 300 milligrams in 250 milliliters yields 1.2 milligrams per milliliter. To get 1 milligram per minute, check for 50 drops per minute or approximately one drop per second. In conclusion, give medications that solve problems. Amiodarone is a strong and effective medication. 
amiodarone does have specific risks that must be taken into consideration in your risk-benefit analysis. Weigh the risk versus benefit for all medications that you administer. Know your medications. And, Dr. Scientist, hopefully that's what we've helped you do here today. Thank you. Take care, and good luck.